Hey folks, welcome to Simulation and Agent-Based Models for Social Networks and Health. The plan today is to go over a set of methods and techniques for simulating data in support of social networks and health research, as the title might suggest. It's a, um, a huge field, right? So there's no way we're gonna go through it all. Instead, we're gonna focus primarily on um, some basic elements for simulation um, modeling that might not be a, you know, well known to lots of folks. And um, to talk through the ways in which the networks um, uh, in particular are amenable to simulation analysis. And uh, then we'll go through a series of case studies um, and some pragmatic um, advice on implementation of pointers. We're not going to do a lot with exact code, like I'm not going to hand you a, a series of ABM codes. Um, if you talk to me offline, I'm happy to share whatever I have. Um, but the main point is to give you some strategies for how to think about simulations and how to implement them um, if you find yourself in a situation like that. Okay. All right, so first the obvious question, what is a simulation? I'm taking a very broad view of it. A simulation is anytime you make up data. Um, so like it could range, I guess, from something like imputation, which is a really tiny kind of simulation, through to full-blown uh, my agent-based simulations where you're making up the world whole cloth and almost everything in between. Fundamentally, the goal is to make up data in a way that answers some question that cannot be answered, answered well otherwise. And so given that you're making it up, you might say, well, why do I care? Like, whatever you make up is irrelevant to what I care about because I care about the world as it is, not the way the world is the way you think it is. Um, but it turns out there are a lot of really good reasons to make up data. The first one is lack of data, right? So you don't often observe the full data that you want to observe. Um, uh, and instead, what you have are um, you know, some partial element of the data and what you would like to have is the full thing. And so because you don't, uh, observe the full network, you want to make up elements that, um, that you know, that, that sort of augment your observation. Now, sometimes this can be, like I said, a missing data problem. So you're just making up a little bit of the data and you have other pieces of it. More often the case is you have a tiny little bit like an ego network and you want to make up what the global network looks like. And so this is a, a, a really, a, usually a simulation of the much bigger scale, even in the lack of data situation than it is otherwise. Um, there's also this notion of, I'm calling it here, unethical treatment effects, but it's just, um, you know, inability or unethical uh, versions in which you would co collect the data otherwise. So, for example, um, I might want to know what the, what, whether or not it's more effective for the community as a whole if I simulate men, if I vaccinate men versus women. Um, you can't do that in an actual trial, right? You can't go out and say, well, I'm going to set aside this community and randomly, um, uh, you know, pick which communities get vaccinized to men and which communities get vaccinized to women, um, that's just an impossible thing to do. Um, but if you know the transmission networks that are underlying what men and women do, then you could simulate that and get at least some sense of what's going on there. Oftentimes, and the kind of, and most of the models that today you're gonna see are these, are the, are extending theory. Um, and the idea is that, as you're gonna see, what a simulation really does is it forces you as an analyst to decide what matters and how you're going to encode what matters. And so to do that requires being really clear about theory. So at least one branch of, of social simulation that and it's a branch that I'm particularly fond of, I guess, um, is a, a theory amplifier or a hypothesis generator. It's about taking a theoretical set of ideas and um, operationalize them in a set of clear rules and then seeing what the implications of those rules are. Now, another area that you might see um, a lot of uh, simulation is in sort of statistical validation. Um, you end up doing this when you're trying to figure out whether or not um, you know, an, estimation or an estimator is biased under a certain data generating process. Um, that's not largely what we're doing here, but you're gonna see some estimates that are kind of like that. Um, in, in particular, we do it a lot when we're trying to evaluate centrality measures or new position measures or something like this. So there is a kind of simulation that happens to that, what is largely in service of developing new methods. A spin on that, which is, I've done a lot of this kind of work, though I'm not gonna talk about it in detail today, is simulating in order to guide data collection. And so if you're, if you're in, about to engage in a really expensive network data collection, it might be nice to know whether or not the data you're gonna get out of that data collection is likely to answer the question you want to answer in the first place. And so it's a good idea oftentimes to do um, sample construction and design simulations first, because those give you a sense of what the possible range looks like. 
just to give you an example, um, if we are interested in figuring out what's the optimal set of people to um, recruit into a sample who would have spillover effects to others, well, then you can simulate different sampling strategies and see which one of these sampling strategies are most likely to have a spillover effect on the rest of the network under a set of super assumptions and such. Okay. So there's a, a fair number of types of sim simulations. Um, and I think that you want to ask yourself a set of questions, right, about what the simulation is and why you're doing it. The first one, it, that really is, what's the purpose? Um, so why do you want to simulate? Is it to guide policy in the way that can't be done with statistical methods, right? Either because the problem is too complex or the treatment is can't be ethically done you know, as, a, as a set? Um, or is it that you just, um, uh, you know, you, you couldn't do it in real time, right? You couldn't get out in front of a uh, uh, you know a setting to figure out whether it's better to you know put vaccination stations in bus stops versus in schools or something, right? The other is um, sort of a grounding question. Is this a question about you know, do you want to simulate because of data issues or because of theory issues? And how much does the question depend on observed facts versus um, uh, uh, or real situations versus theoretical ideas? Um, and so a, a classic example of this would be. Um, uh, do you want to control for the network structure or use expert, expert data in a, um, uh, a peer influence model? Or um, for you might want to simulate something like predicting um, you know, the, the number of people who are going to need social security payments in 50 years as a basis of the number of people who need them now, right? And so you can project with a population projection that's a kind of simulation. And the second is sort of a realism versus um, toy model dimension, which is, how much detail do you want to include? Um, as you're going to see, this ends up being a, a, a common question in um, agent-based modeling. And people have this idea that I can, that I'm kind of playing like Sim City or something, and I can throw lots and lots and lots of details. I can give them a red tractor and a blue tractor and my avatar of all that kind of stuff. And 90% of that stuff is irrelevant, right? What really matters is the question that you want to answer. And in fact, it becomes problematic if you end up putting too much detail into a survey because you can end up having um, uh, essentially more realism than you can pull out. And so you can't learn anything from the model. All right, so I like to think about simulations broadly then in this kind of a, of a, of a simulation space. And so you have this realism um, uh, versus illustration kind of dimension, which is the vertical one, and you have a theory versus data dimension. There's also a, um, uh, uh, another set of dimensions that have to do with data fidelity, and another that has to do with, um, you know, so is the data actually tested against something? Um, uh, is it, and do you care about how it performs in that test versus what you're learning otherwise? So there are lots of other ways you could organize this. Um, I've found this useful for thinking about social networks and health ideas. So at this sort of Lower left corner over here, you have these um, toy models that are entirely based on things you're making up. There is no link to reality whatsoever. There's no point to link it to, that, to reality. That's not the purpose of the simulation. The simulation's point is to illustrate um, uh, the some unknown feature of a theoretical model. So the shelling segregation model, the point of that model is that there are emergent properties at the community level that are going to the it's many times radically amplify individual level biases. And so you don't need things like redlining and historical sets and all this to generate segregation in a city. So long as people have just a small preference for having same race neighbors, their compounded preferences are going to generate a segregated city, even if everything else is perfectly fair. So imagine layering it out on top of a substrate that's not fair, right? And so that's really all a mind exercise. At the far end of this, on the other end, is something like um, a CORSIM, um, uh, which was a simulation model that was designed to predict who was going to need Social Security benefits. Um, this model takes um, is built on extending data from reality. And so you have a bunch of data sets on real people um, that you've collected in real time, and you're asking them real questions. And the whole simulation is a series of equations, regression equations, that, that predict one outcome that feed into the next outcome and so forth, and you've iterated it. So you've built a really strong, tight-fitting prediction model, and that model then is tuned to move forward and predict, at least in the short term, right? And so the two versions of this, at the, at the, at the core sim version of this model, 
you don't really care what's going on under the hood. What you care is that it's accurate, that it's predicting something on the outside end that you want to know for the future. Um, and if, whereas on the other end, what you really care about is why this is happening. What's the social process that's generating? And there's lots of other ways that these things get mixed and mingled. Um, so this is just an archetype for thinking about it. All right. So when you start thinking then about how you're going to build the simulation, I like to think about the simulation in terms of these three elements. You have an environment, you have agents, and you have rules. And it turns out then that the rules are of two types. We're going to get to that in a second. The environment is the setting within which your agents act. This usually consists of features your agents can draw on, right? So in the simplest example, it might be an end by end grid of potential spaces that um, your agents could move to. Um, it might be um, you know, a set of resources that you can draw on in a sugar scape model or something like this, but this is the place where your agents interact. A key element of the environment is usually other agents. And so the extent to which you can bump into other agents, how you bump into those other agents, what those um, interactions with other agents mean, that's a, a key part, particularly for network models, of what the environment consists of. Agents are the actors in your model. Agents are active. They draw on resources from the environment, so that inputs from the environment. They do something with those inputs, and they react, which creates an input for another agent. This is the key element of an agent-based model, is that agents draw inputs from the environment and or each other. They do something with those agents and they output them back to the environment or to other agents. And that's the interdependence that generates complexity that makes agent-based models interesting. Um, and how that's done is through a process of rules. So the rules encode your theory of how actors behave and respond to situations. The set of rules you write should encapsulate the social process you are trying to mimic, right? That's a, a pretty straightforward idea. You want to think about the ways in which your actors would react to the situation they found themselves in and then you know, mimic that in code. Now, this is a lot harder to do than it sounds as I put it on this page. Um, and so we're gonna dig into the ways in which you do that in detail. Um, but there are lots of things that agents do that are irrelevant, and there are a lot of relevant things that agents do that you might not be aware of. So finding a way on, on either side to tune your rule set is, you know, is really 90% of the game. Agent rules are a little different, right? The, the way that agents make decisions and make and deal with the inputs they've given to create new outputs are a little different than what I'm calling global processing rules, um, but both are important. So global processing rules are rules governing how the simulation proceeds. So what counts as a time step in your iteration model, um, whether or not um, nodes act simultaneously or in parallel. So these things might seem like housekeeping issues, but it turns out they can often have important issues. I'll give you a quick example. Um, this is one of the simplest um, uh, archetypical uh, agent-based models in existence. This is the shelling segregation model. The idea is that you have some space that actors can live in, right? And that's just represented by a, a cell on a, in this case, a 50 by 50 grid. Um, actors have a preference. That's the only rule, right? So each agent has a preference for the color of their neighbors. And that preference is they want some of their neighbors to be like them. And so in this case, um, uh, we say that if you were then alpha percent of your neighbors are the same color as you, you pick at random another open spot in the, in this, in the grid and you go there. And if they are above your threshold, um, uh, then you stay where you're at. And so that's the only rule that these agents have. Now the global processing rule in this case is that agents are selected to choose at random and the updates are made immediately. So the process is serial. That is that you don't get to make a decision on where you're gonna live until I've already made a decision on where I'm gonna live, right? If, if, if I'm chosen randomly, right? And, it, and, they, and the other issue here is that this simulation, the stopping rule is it stops when the user tells it to stop because it's an interactive program or when there's no more um, moves to be made. So if you were to imagine playing this out, um, uh, this is the result you get. So even though most people would like to have um, uh, have a preference for um, only a minority of their neighbors being um, the same color as them, they end up being in neighborhoods that are largely same color, right? And so this is with a 30% rule. And there are a couple of things you can imagine thinking about this. Um, notice that in this particular case, it's a pretty dense network, right? So everybody, almost every cell is in fact, about 95% of the cells are filled. Um, if you then lower that, you get a little bit of white in this network. So these are empty spaces, same exact rules. Otherwise run it again, you still see a lot of segregation, but note these little funky spaces here where nothing is going on, 
That's because in this simulation, the empty cells are treated as irrelevant. So people are, are only, as part of the processing rule, they're only dividing by the neighbors that are non-empty, the non-empty cells. And that can actually have some pretty weird implications. If you were to make this a really rural area, if you will, so a lot of spaces are empty, then it turns out that the next nearest neighbor might be someone who's different from you. Um, but in fact, that they're not exactly adjacent to you because you can put a barrier between you and empty space allows these agents to, to, um, uh, you know, to essentially not meet this minimum uh, neighbor rule. Now, is that a feature or a bug, right? So that depends on your theory of the space and you have to think through that really carefully. You can change a different rule. Here, I'm gonna raise the alpha to 50. So I wanna, I just wanna at least, uh, I want at least half my neighbors to be like me. Um, then you get an even stronger outcome, right? So in this game, you see almost everybody is, is adjacent to a neighborhood that is completely homogeneous. Now, because this network, um, this space, I pointed this out above here, I didn't highlight it later, um, is that this is what's called a torus. So this space that the agents are moving in is actually connected top to bottom and left to right. And so the thing's wrapped around like a sphere, if you will. Um, and that means that this similarity is actually tied to this space. Um, but otherwise, it's an emergent property of the network. So it's a, this is just a, a classic example that sort of illustrates these pieces. It's really important, though, to think about these global processing rules. Again, they sound like housekeeping rules, but they're often not. Um, and so the first one is something like an update rule. Do you update parallel versus serial? That is, when do agents see changes in the setting? Um, in a serial model, each agent acts, right? One of the agents act one at a time. They do something that affects the environment and then the next agent acts. That's exactly what happened in the um, uh, shelling segregation model. Parallel is each action happens, like given the state of reality right now, I do something. Um, at this very moment, you're also doing something given the state of your environment, right? And so we're acting at the same time in parallel. Um, what that means is that we can do some things relative to each other that might be um, in conflict, right? So you imagine trying to do a shelling segregation model in parallel, two nodes could try to move to the same cell and that wouldn't work. So we'd have to end up with a way to, to fix that. So reality is often parallel. Simulations are often serial. Um, sometimes you can make the simulations parallel by fixing the inputs, letting every node um, do its do its internal processing and then putting their output simultaneously into the model for the next iteration. But think through your process. Ask yourself, is that sensible? Is that the kind of thing you want to happen? Does it help? Now, parallel processing is really useful for some kinds of models. Think like a flocking model, like birds moving, because birds, in fact, each bird is its own processor. And so if its only rule is say next to a bird that it's next to, that works just fine. It um, is a little harder often to program um, if you can't generate um, uh, you know, parallel processors. So if you're trying to simulate a parallel social process on a serial computation machine, you have to do some tricks to make that happen. Okay. When you update your network, do you do it in a fixed or random order? That is, you might assume that you're just going to iterate over all nodes one to end. And so I take them and I do that. But if your network happened to be so sorted by age of the nodes, then you're implicitly sorting on something that's there. So we typically randomize um, if you're going to do sort order. Um, but then if you're going to if you're going to randomize, do you go one time through each person or do at each iteration, everyone get an equal probability of being drawn, which means that some people will be drawn multiple times before the next person is drawn. Um, again, all of these are reasonable, like you can defend why you do it, but you want to be clear that you understand why you're doing it, because it, it might matter. Um, lost my key, there we are. Um, what is your uproot date rules, right? Again, so do you have a fixed population? So is, is the, the case that people live in a neighborhood in the Schelling case, and that the population I have at the start of the simulation is the same population I have at the end of the simulation? Or do people die? And if people die, do new people enter, right? If people enter, um, how does that happen, right? What's the birth process? What's the population replacement process? These can be really complicated. If you wanna do a model that's where you're simulating something like a family structure model or a career trajectory or something, Thing. Um, you need some way to get that population turnover process to happen that doesn't lead to massive waves of cohorts of people who are dying at the same time. So for example, if you said that um, people uh, you know, essentially have a probability of dying when they reach 80 years old, that is much higher than not, and you have a classic sort of risk curve, um, but everyone starts your simulation at 20, 
that means that by iteration 60, everybody dies, right? And so that's not a good idea because then everyone has to get born at the same time and you'll get these crazy temporal waves, right? So you then need to initialize your, your agent-based model with a set of um, people who have a reasonable age distribution and probably do some kind of a burn-in process before you actually start your experiment to make sure that you don't get these kinds of pieces. The point is, and all of this is just a point to say um, uh, that everything that you put in a simulation is all that is in the simulation and everything matters. So when you think about doing a simulation, you really do have to think very carefully that what you're doing are the things you want it to do. And you need to watch out very carefully to make sure that the things that you haven't put in there, right, or something that you hadn't thought about that you did put in there is happening the way you want it to. All right. Now, the way the main thing that you want to do when you're doing a, a, a simulation usually is some kind of an experiment. You want to you want to have a social situation and you change something like the alpha parameter in the in the shelling model, and see what effect that has on the system because the effect it has on the system is the um, you know is the research question of interest. Um, and so what that thing you're trying to study is is usually a parameter. So I'll have something like the alpha parameter. And so then the question you want to ask is what's the number of parameters you want to put in the model? And this is where that that interpolation between realism and toy models becomes into play because reality has millions of parameters, right? So if you think about the things that are governing the likelihood of getting COVID-19, well, there's all have to do with the kind of jobs you have, the kind of age you are, the places you live, the places you go, the amount of time you spend in all of these places, right? So reality is really, really, really complex. And what your your base idea is, if I'm going to make a reality on my, you know, in silico, I just make it up on the spot. That I want that reality to that I'm making up to look a lot like the reality that is real. But the trap that gets you in is that you'll on, end up generating thousands of parameters the vast majority of which will be irrelevant or will be relevant in ways that you can't discern from the simulation. So you might have a simulation that is realistic, but is completely uninformative. And so then you have to find some way to parse through the millions of parameters you've set, you generated and um, make sense of that. The other question you need to ask yourself is what's the value of the parameters you want to do, right? And so it turns out that for most social phenomena, when you, when you get into the details, some of these um, uh, values really matter and some of them don't matter at all. And there's usually some sort of a sweet spot where a change in the parameter will lead to a change in the system. But if you get too far at one end or too far at the other, the, the, the simulation just goes to you know some kind of a a weird corner point that's not useful. So for example, if I made it the case that my, everybody that has a disease can pass it to their neighbors with perfect probability, their the transmission probability is one, then all I'm going to do with a, the, with a diffusion simulation is reproduce the geodesic structure of the graph. I'm not going to learn anything that's not already in the network. Whereas if I leave it down in the middle there, then there's room for loops and twists and things that could be different to make a difference, right? So you want to think carefully about what the value of the parameter is. That's a slightly different question than how many draws from the value range. So if I'm interested in a probability of admission between 0.02 you know, and 0.08, I could take two draws or 50 draws, right? So it could be a really continuous set or a really lumpy set. That's a separate question. It's a computational time question. What I'm pointing to here is this question about what's the relevant value of the set of parameters to give something meaningful and useful, okay? All right, so those are general question points that have to do with any agent-based model that you're going to do. In the case we're interested in here, the question has to do with um, what is it about networks per se that we want to think about, right? And I like to break this problem into, you know, two dimensions. One is a simulation on networks, right? Where which, what we're interested in is the way in which something spreads across a given network. Now, I'm taking spread here in the most general sense. It could be an attitude where it's moving back and forth in lots of ways. It could be a disease. It could be a paperback novel, right? So there's lots of different things that can spread in a network. But the point is the network is fixed and there's some social process where agents, by virtue of being connected on the network, then talk to each other or do something that changes their input and output on the system environment, right? And so in those sorts of simulations, you either take the network you're given or you use a simple my network from an archetype set of classes. And most of the effort is built into the agent rules that govern how they react to the state of your neighbors, right? And disease diffusions are the archetype. 
simulations of networks are designed to figure out how the network itself came to be, right? And so what is it that generates the structure of the network? And there are, you know, lots of ways to think about this, but a simple one is to distinguish between exogenous features and endogenous features, right? So then the exogenous feature says that people who um, live next to each other are more likely to talk to people who, than people who don't live to each other. If you simulate a network like that, you're going to get a network that looks a lot like the city because, you know, that was the rule that went into it. And so there are a lot of these kinds of networks, um, simulation models, where what you're doing is you're generating uh, the network from some set of attributes by virtue of a probability distribution. Ergum simulations are what I'm thinking about here as the archetype. You have some kind of model that you estimated on a data set. That data set tells you the probability that people of a certain kind are likely to be connected to each other. You then generate a simulation from that network um, probability distribution to get a sense of some other properties that might not have gone into the one. So by, by virtue of your distribution of characteristics, you might get some interesting patterns in the network that you didn't expect. It turns out that there are a lot of really interesting things to learn about networks um, from this that be when you start with some really simple assumptions. And I'm going to go through a couple of examples that we've had some luck with and luck by meaning I think we've learned something from by virtue of doing it that at their intuitively don't sound that interesting when you first start. And I'll talk to you some examples of that. Some cases that are, I think, on their face more interesting um, uh, and we might be intuitively drawn to are endogenous network changes. And the classic example here would be something like social balance. If you and if a friend of a friend is a friend and you generate that as a, a rule that your agents follow, what happens? And so we can talk about some of those as well. Now, as you might imagine, um, and this is the parameter um, uh, spread I warned you about, if I can do one or the other, why not do both, right? Why not simulate the network and the behavior simultaneously, because oftentimes we would imagine that the behavior that people learn through the networks affect who they talk to. So for example, if smoking um, generates popularity in some way um, uh, and peers talk to each other in ways that influence who they, whether or not they're gonna smoke, then you could imagine that um, people's decisions to start smoking affects their popularity, which then in turn affects the likelihood that they talk to someone who does or doesn't smoke if they themselves smoke. And so there's a feedback process of the behavior that people are engaged in and the relationships they have. This is, of course, as I just pointed out, um, uh, implicitly the logic behind Sienna models. And um, David Schaefer and Cassie have a, uh, uh, Macmillan have a really nice um, new simulation um, uh, and Sienna modeling set that they're gonna talk about in detail. So I'm not gonna go over Sienna models in detail today, um, but just know that that's that logic of those models. Belief polarization is another example that if I um, am influenced in my political beliefs by the people I talk to, um, but I only choose to talk to people who think the same way I do, then those networks create echo chambers quickly um, as a virtue of um, the feedback process built into it. All right. There are some what I'm going to call perhaps non-obvious cautionary points when you're doing a network simulation. Um, and what I want to do is just throw these out here so that you keep them in mind because it's really easy to do silly things on a network simulation and not realize it um, uh, until you've gone down uh, the road quite a bit. The first one is a simple something like a degree constraint. If you look out at the real world that we live in and we think about things like strong ties or friendship networks or something, they typically have um, a pretty constrained and well-known degree distribution. Um, if your simulation doesn't generate that, that set or doesn't respect that, um, it's probably going to be wrong or at least not that informative. Um, so, for example, if I generate a network simulation that says a friend of a friend should be a friend, and all of a sudden I end up with a network clique every time, then I probably have a parameter tuned so high um, that it can't do anything but fold in on itself. It creates this degree constraint that's not there, right? And so there's some basic moments of the network distribution that you wanna make sure you hit. And you can do that in one of two ways. It could be that you generate the deg degree distribution de novo. It comes out of the agent rules you've given it. It might be that you don't care about the thing that makes some people really gregarious and other people really introverted. You're gonna take that as given. And so I'm gonna fix the degree distribution and ask how people allocate them. Both are perfectly reasonable. Like there are just different answers to different questions or take other parts as given, but decide ahead of time what you wanna do and keep in mind that um, you can often write simulations that create massively unrealistic degree distributions. 
A second point is that simulations often work in an iterative fashion, either explicitly you write a loop to do it or implicitly you work over some kind of vector that has um, uh, time implicitly built into it. The question is then what part of that iterative history are your agents attuned to? That is, do your agents have any memory whatsoever? And you might think, well, of course they do. My, my, in the real world, I have memory, so my agents must have memory. But you often don't write it that way, right? Think about the shelling simulation we wrote just above there. In that model, each agent just looked at its immediate neighborhood and decided that if it was happy, it would move or it would stay. If it was unhappy, it would move. But there's nothing to stop them from moving right back to the neighborhood they left on the next iteration if where they hopped was an, a place that there also makes them unhappy. So it could be the case that we, we pay really close attention to the contemporaneous environment of our agents, but don't pay attention to the social history that would be meaningful. And this is important in things like romantic relationships, right? It's pretty rare for people to break up in reality, form a new relationship, and then go back to their ex, right? So past romantic partner is a pretty strong negative constraint on the formation of a new romantic relationship tie. But how do you store that? How do you keep records of that? And then do you make sure you build that in ahead of way? The other thing to keep in mind, is, so that is the point is, is that you want to make sure you either don't care about memory, that the process is purely Markovian, or you build in some capacity to monitor memory in a way that's efficient, which is sometimes more difficult to do. Final one is this notion then of um, uh, uh, runaway configurations. Um, feedback process models um, uh, can easily walk you into situations that are radically unrealistic. So I hinted at that above when I said you would think about like generating cliques, but you can have these things that are effectively degenerate models where what you're doing is the rule set you gave generates a network structure that is so unrealistic as to be meaningless. The question then, is that an informative meaninglessness or is it not? It could be that you have developed a really well-tuned um, rule set for a theoretical process that then generates an unrealistic outcome that tells you your theoretical process is crap, right? And so that's, that's good. You've now learned something from your simulation. If instead, you've um, just written a bad operationalization of an ad hoc informal rule, that bad operation then takes you to a space that's not realistic. You haven't learned anything other than the fact that your, your rule sucked, right? So you need to spend a lot of time looking out for these problems and thinking about what they mean very carefully because it's really easy to write a crappy rule. And if you write a crappy rule, you're gonna get a crappy outcome in the outset. So you wanna make sure that you get that right. All right, so now what I wanna do is just, I, and it, it's hard to give generalizations on these. So I think the best way to learn them is to think through a, a set of case studies. So I'm gonna go through now and just talk through some examples we've, did, we've done and you know, hope you'll learn something from them. So I'm gonna start with one of the simplest ones we can do, which is to think about um, uh, the problem of concurrency as a graph connectivity problem. And what that means is we can imagine some really proscribed limited amount of time and ask ourselves, you know, within a couple of weeks or something like this in a real world, it doesn't really matter. Um, and ask ourselves, what would happen if we interpolated between two kinds of worlds? So like one world where everybody um, uh, was in a monogamous relationship had only one problem. So that's the, the lower limit. And other where almost everybody had multiple partners. Um, what, what does that space of network configurations look like? And so to put this in the language that we've been dealing with thus far, our environment is just a random graph. So I'm really putting nothing else on this, right? The only constraint are the number of other actors you're connected to right now. Um, agents are nodes who have relations in a fixed degree. So I'm gonna say you're the kind of person that's monogamous that has two partners or has three partners, just very simple. Um, and the agent rule is we form relations at random until all the degrees are allocated and the global process is a one-shot randomization formation. So this is about as simple as you could do. And you get this finding. This is some work I've done with Martina Morris and Jimmy Adams. The um, process here is to, again, like I said, imagine this world where most people have one partner or two partners um, and very few people have three. In that kind of world, you get almost no connectivity, right? Everything is, is pretty um, weakly connected. Bump up this distribution of people who are monogamous to those who have at least two partners and you come up a little bit more, you get to see this kind of dendrilic but slightly reconnected setting 
little more degree, I'm gonna shift it to two, you get a lot, a little more degree, you get even more, right? So in this case, we've interpolated between a very narrow range, if you look at it, an average of 1.68 to 1.87, and you move from disconnected to connected. Well, what's going on here? It turns out, oh, this is an example, a little eye candy for what that looks like. It turns out that these four networks sit on the edge of a thing known as a phase transition. And so in this particular network, if you have, uh, if your population has on average below 1.75 ties, right, you're very unlikely to get any connectivity out at all. This is this, the number of people who can reach each other in the network, the size of the largest component. This is the size of the largest low degree component or bi component, excuse me. And so here you can see that, um, in a very short order of time, and of course, that's why I picked these example networks, you end up with a rapid shift from no connectivity to high connectivity. Now, this is in a world where the range of degree distributions is really narrow. Well, that's kind of curious. What happens if we um, uh, make that range really wide? We allow for this thing called the scale-free distribution and then, and then do the exact same ex exercise, simulate the networks, um, uh, but now we have a different mean degree and all the mean is being driven by activity out of the tail, a few people with a lot of ties. Then what you see is you still see a phase transition, but it begins a lot earlier and it progresses a lot more slowly and the reconnected core is a lot smaller. All right, so this is kind of interesting. And this is why I think we've learned, this was a, when I said before it was a, a useful simulation, is because even though this is really simple, what it's doing is it's telling us something that, that I think is informative of the world, which is that um, in a world where, the, where the, the connectivity in the network is driven by the tail, you get a different shape risk profile to overall volume than you do um, uh, if the risk profile is really narrow. In places where people have multiple partners, but not lots of multiple partners, then you get this really hard to find a um, very narrow range between nothing and everything. Whereas in the scale-free distribution, you at least get some room to play with. And if you're a public health, you might be able to see like you know where something starts to emerge versus where it doesn't. So I go through some examples here. Um, uh, we said so. You know, once I once you can do a little, why not do a lot? Um, we went ahead and um, did this same kind of simulation where we're looking at a short degree distribution versus a long tail degree distribution, and literally looked at every possible network um, uh, that could be generated in that space. A pure brute force search um, over this state space and identified series of networks, right, that could fill into each of these spaces. And it turns out that this, this space has a really interesting, you know, property. This, the, the set of networks that fall into this space um, kind of look interesting. And what they look like is that over here in this low tailed degree distribution, right, or sorry, scale free degree distribution, <coughs> excuse me, about low volume, you get really long dendrils, but a tightly reconnected core. So it only takes a small number of really highly active nodes to create this knot in the middle where disease could keep moving, right? And if you shift down over to the other end here in the low degree distribution, you still get dendrils and a core, but notice how thin this core is, right? There's very few reconnections. And that's because the limit to very few people having more than three degrees means that you're getting essentially chains that reloop on, but they're very long chains. Whereas up here, in the case we showed a second ago, come on, go backwards on me, machine. Oh, my machine's starting to die. That's not good. Um, let's... All right, sorry about that, folks. A little glitch there. Um, computer was <laughs> giving up the ghost. If we jump over to the higher volume scent, of course, you get greater reconnectivity. Um, uh, but again, it's sort of a core periphery um, being driven, in this case, largely by a, a group of people at the tails. And if you go to the far end, then it's just not so, right? And so you might yourself ask yourself, well, what's the point of doing this kind of um, exhaustive search over the setting? Well, it shows you that this phase transition actually is a plane in this two-dimensional space driven by shape of the distribution of the degree and volume of the distribution of degree. And it has this really sharp edge right here where there's almost nothing and then pow, almost everybody, right? You go from almost nobody and these lower heads are connected to a really sharp phase transition. Um, uh, it's smoother over here for the long tail than it is for the short tail, but it's the, sort of this cliff driven here. If you think about how this might map onto the real world, you could imagine a situation where commercial sex work um, is driving the tail of your degree distribution. And a um, set of uh, 
what do you call them, you know, policies or something that is, it is aimed towards, you know, persecuting commercial sex workers. Um, if you're doing that, effectively what you're doing is you're trimming the tail of the degree distribution by making it hard for commercial sex workers to, to do their jobs, um, but you're not changing the demand. So in that case, you're changing the shape, but you're not changing the volume. And if you're over here in this world and you change the shape and you push yourself down this way towards this lower degree distribution, you actually make things worse. And so it is the case that these kinds of ideas could help inform um, policy and say, well, what you don't wanna do is change the shape of the degree distribution and spread this thing out more widely. Instead, what you wanna do is lower the volume. And you're probably gonna have more effect there focusing on Johns than you do on commercial sex work. That's a bit of a, of a detailed examination. We have a few more of these. You can read this one in the notes. Right, so this one has to do with concurrency. It turns out that, again, if you run a, a simulation model, you can identify the situations in which um, uh, concurrency really matters. It turns out, and this is a measure of how much, how likely it is for infection to spread in the network. And this is a measure of concurrency, the proportion of, of relationships that overlap in time. And it turns out in some kinds of networks, you get this, um, they're already at high risk, even at low concurrency. So the return to concurrency is positive, but it's not really dramatic. Whereas in these kind of networks, you find out that um, in cases where there isn't any concurrency, you get very low risk of spread. But once you get concurrency, you get high levels of spread. What this turns out, it, this is being driven by, is the um, cohesiveness of the networks. If your network has lots of reconnected loops in it, then you're already at high risk, even if there's no concurrency. And that's because the exposure network has so many alternate routes it can go through that timing is somewhat inconsequential. Whereas if you have um, relatively low cohesive networks, that is networks that are characterized by multiple cut points, then the sequencing of relations has a huge effect on the likelihood that something will be able to pass forward in time, and thus concurrency matters a lot. And so if we ask ourselves, well, why is it that in some settings with high concurrency, um, uh, um, or, or you know, in some places we have high infection, even if we have low concurrency, it's probably because the underlying structure of the network is one that's, that's creating these kinds of reinforcing loops as opposed to these long chains. All right. That was an example of a, of a network or you're simulating a, a network um, that's based on uh, you know, a very simple static exogenous rule. In this case, we fix degree. We also have simulations that are based on the dynamics of the network itself. And I'm gonna leave this to you to read in the slides because it's not particularly strong on the, um, uh, you know, on the health relevant side. It's just, I think, a, a good example of the ways in which we have an endogenous feature. And what we did is in this particular simulation, we asked, well, what does it take for a person to move from one triad state to the other? And what is the, what's the return to a social balance rule if they make that move? And it turns out that when you do that, there's lots of different ways you can walk through this network. Um, and again, there's a lot more detail if you're interested in it. But when you do the simulation, what comes to find out is that if you have actors that really seek transitivity versus those who try to avoid intransitivity, it's the seeking transitivity that ends up um, uh, uh, really creating um, the clustered sort of hierarchy that we expect to see. Moreover, if you're just seeking a lot of, if you're trying to avoid intransitivity, your network never stabilizes. This is a correlation with prior time points, right? The, um, the network only stabilizes once people seek, actively seek a friend of a friend is a friend. You can't just say my enemy's enemy is my friend. You can't just be avoiding enemies. You have to be seeking friends in order for the thing to coalesce. Just a nice example. Um, if you're doing a, the, the other, the biggest branch, I think by far of simulations in social networks and health literature is simulating a diffusion process of some sort. And these models um, sort of have this basic archetypical SI or SIR, the susceptible infected recovered um, framework. And you can imagine the pseudocode looks something like this, right? For a given network structure, you seed it with a little bit of infection, for as long as there are discordant pairs in the network, then um, uh, you, you pass it from an infected to a susceptible with some known transmission probability. And then for each actor that has been infected, um, uh, there's some risk of recovery over time, right? And, and once you've passed that risk, 
you move into the recovered state, right? So this is a, a classic setup and you could literally implement it like this. The question that we ask typically are, are things about which network structure. So why do some network structures create high diffusion rates and other network structures do not? And you might want to be able to answer that question um, with a very simple simulation like this. And so I can say, let's generate lots of different network structures and see what happens. Ashton Verder and I, Verdery and I, excuse me, have done just this. And the idea here is that we simulate the network over and over and over again. Um, we simulate a sorry, diffusion process many times on lots of different networks with lots of different structures. And then we can ask what kinds of structures have faster, more complete diffusion profiles than those that don't. Um, so we just ran a, a simple diffusion process over all the ad health networks um, and compared how they differ in their overall structure independent of anything that has to do with the, um, uh, the characteristics of the nodes. So in this particular network, for example, you see this a really highly clustered network. The junior high and the high school are very segregated and different from each other, whereas in this network, they're not. And so we can measure these network level characteristic and ask what happens as they spread through. All right, so how does that work? Um, we measure that by looking at diffusion curves. Um, so this is one diffusion curve moving through time for a single school. Um, uh, and so each iteration generates, a over each iteration time step, there's some probability of transfer. The average is given with this curve right here, right? And so what we're gonna do as our dependent variable is, com is compare the area under this observed cumulative diffusion curve with the same area for a similar random network. And so the difference between this area and that area is the extent to which these networks are um, diffusion prone, right? So the closer you are to random, the more likely you are to get um, high diffusion. Real networks almost never spread faster than random networks, just as a, as a rule. We go through then ask what drives diffusion. I'm gonna give you the take home pay, the take home story. The take home story is what really matters is the average length in the network. So really long, broad networks have slow diffusion processes, but that's contravened by the amount of um, overall cohesion there is in the network. So again, if there's lots of alternate routes, then path distance doesn't matter. And so there's always this trade-off between distance and cohesion. Okay. Again, that was really fast, but I wanted to give you a, a sense of how these things work. Another example, right, is you don't have to have um, simulations where only one thing is moving through the network. You might have competing things. And this is a great paper, um, Berlang Mao and Ling Bian, um, uh, that simulates simultaneously um, uh, the spread of the flu and people's behavior to stop getting the flu. And so these two things simultaneously are competing with each other um, uh, and they're both moving through an underlying connectivity network. Okay. Um, hey folks, sorry, a quick little bump there in my comp computer setup, sorry about that. Um, so anyway, I, another example of a diffusion on a network process is when you're looking at something like competing diffusions. And these are fun examples because in these cases, the things through moving through the network can have um, competing risks and those things can offset each other, which is exactly what you want to have happen when you're looking for some of the, it's a great case to run a simulation model on because um, you can really ask fun questions about feedback processes. And if you, you know, really invest heavily in, um, you know, Tamiflu or other kinds of um, uh, practices for some sets as opposed to others, um, does that um, have a multiplier or a spillover effect on people's avoidance behaviors in ways that it might not otherwise do? So again, this is a, a, a paper that's fun. And in this case, their mixing model, the underlying network was space-based. So you're also able to get this notion of the ways in which um, the probability of becoming infected or the probability of adopting um, protective behaviors and whether or not these things differ spatially um, uh, by like that in the network. Um, I'm going to take a quick break here and we're going to break this presentation up into two parts um, because I see that my machine is about to reboot on me whether I like it or not. So hold this thought and I'll be back with you in just a minute. I'm going to stop the recording and I'll see you guys at the start of part two in just a moment. 